Welcome to Three, a part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. The much anticipated Novak Djokovic versus Carlos Alcaraz semifinal is in the books, and it goes the way of Djokovic in four sets. He will meet Casper Ruud in the final. He will be gunning for his 23rd major title. And on this episode, we're going to talk about that Alcaraz match. We are going to look ahead to the final against Rude. Uh, let's start with that semi. I want to leave it open-ended. Uh, Amy, two mm-hmm. sets of marvelous tennis. Yeah. Uh, the second set was mind-blowing. But then for the next two sets, it was it was Djokovic standing and Alcaraz completely uh, physically wilted. I'm so sorry that Alcaraz was, was hampered physically and, and had cramps. The exact same thing has happened to me. I was playing, I had to play two matches in one day once, and this was two year two years ago. And my hand was like this. I was like, you know, like a Star Trek character or something. And it, it cramped up and I had a cramp in my calf. So I know that once those things get started, it's impossible to stop them. Um, I, I know that it can relate to nerves because in my situation, we were in a big, you know, regional tournament and everything was on the line for us. So, I mean, multiply that times a million. And that's probably what Carlitos was feeling in that second set when he when he pulled that out and drew even so um but again i think it, it's the that mental balance and managing your energy and your nerves and your hydration and everything it's all part of it and novak djokovic has played you know six hour matches and grand slams and it it really goes back to what we said in the pregame that it was wisdom and experience versus youth and wisdom and experience won the day. Yeah. And it's interesting. Second year in a row, a young contender has uh, had physical things hurt him in the semis versus a legend, just like last year was Zverev and Adele. Zverev got injured and came off the court in a wheelchair, but that didn't quite happen to Alcaraz, but it was, uh, it's interesting. I think, and I think he has some thinking to do about, energy hydration fitness move uh, there's there's something uh, if i can jump in i okay i don't think hydration had anything to no, do with it i agree with that but let me just i think okay. it has to pick nerves i just how energy management that's what we're talking about right i i agree it is also very hot today and just energy management and how that all plays out because this isn't the first time this has happened to him and yep. it's something to look out for Alcaraz. In the meantime, Novak, boy, he just stepped in and handled it right from the start. Let's let's talk about what we saw in the first two sets in a moment, but I guess to wrap up the, the Alcaraz cramping thing, I think what you said, Amy, about the experience thing, that was mostly it to me. Now look, Djokovic makes you work really hard with the, with the intensity of the tennis, harder than anybody else. Uh, yes, it was hot, about 87 degrees in Paris. But at the end of the day, I think Alcaraz, and I was watching his body language in the first set, he just looked unbelievably stressed and tense. And that's not normally what he looks like. He looks like he's actually out in the park playing a practice set. That's normally what he looks like when he's playing a match, except for the fist pumps. Uh, In the second set, I thought it started to look a little bit normal. But I mean, what he said after the match is what I suspected he'd say after the match. He was just overwhelmed by the occasion the opponent had something to do with it uh was you know that made part of the occasion but i think it was just stress and for djokovic i've been there a million times i i know what this feels like i know how to manage myself and that's why physically he uh he was the one who was left completely fine and i'm sure he would have been fine if it went another 2 3 hours absolutely and just remember novak earlier in his career had some physical things that he ended up resolving with diet and fitness and a whole bunch of things that by 2011 made him tremendous. So, um, yeah, interesting, uh, interesting process. Djokovic has won his last eight five setters. 
Uh, it wasn't that long ago uh, we were talking about Nadal winning a five-setter against Medvedev where, where Daniil uh, started cramping in the third set, uh, and, and it was Rafa who was physically stronger. Uh, the team 2021 final was five sets. The Tsitsipas Roland Garros final. Um, sorry, team wasn't 2021, but, it, you know, a couple years back. Um, anyway, I mean, these five setters, it's so interesting. I mean, the endurance is still not seemingly a problem. We'll just keep it to Novak right now. I mean, Amy, what is your read on how, – how do we explain that, that at 36 years old, there's no endurance problem, never has been? Not that he needed a ton of endurance in this match, but just in general, it, it hasn't been a problem since he was young. Gil, can I get the website of that disc again? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's attention to detail, and this is – one of the things that makes different people in different fields in all walks of life great. It's just extreme attention to detail. And and not only physically was he superior, but I think he had a really good strategy. I think he probably had a plan A, plan B, and plan C, and he followed it to the T. In the first set, um, he served really well. You made a tweet, Gil, about the way Carlitos was serving, um, saying that he was basically using a kick serve pretty slow for his first serve. And I went back and I looked at, I mean, you really cannot look at match stats for this match, right? You got to throw away those last two sets. Um, I looked at match stats for, for for uh, Carlitos, you were right. 83% first serve in. That's too high. That mm -hmm. means you're not going for enough. Only 58% first serve points won for Carlitos in that first set. That was a bad strategy. Um, Novak didn't have, I believe he didn't have any aces, but he had three double faults. But you could tell that he was really varying speed spins, locations, everything with his serve and, and really approached it with a lot of thoughtfulness. So I thought Novak really picked a strategy, well-prepared homework, and he followed through with it. Yeah. I like that stuff about the attention to detail. And that's been a part of Djokovic's career right down to his strokes. I mean, we really saw in this match, the, as we've seen many times, the efficiency of his game, the efficiency of his technique and how he just, went after it. I mean, striking balls deep and hard and maybe, and sensing maybe with the serve patterns that Alcaraz was feeling a little less uh, confident in the delivery. I mean, if, if Alcaraz is saying nerves get to him, then when nerves are part of the picture, you rely on the more safe thing, you know, kick serve, get in first serve, but it's kind of like, you're not, not, not being as expressive and aggressive as he usually is. Yeah. I also think it was trying to run back a strategy that worked in Madrid where the kick serve was his best serve and and it was it was getting the job done not in getting free points or aces but in setting up the plus one uh but but carlitos ended up having a lot of trouble finishing points quickly amy you sent us a tweet uh someone who understands uh S spanish was able to translate a message that carlitos delivered to his box basically saying look i can't play first strike tennis uh i i need to I think what he was saying there, Amy, was your interpretation of this, was that I need to be more consistent because I keep missing in the first five balls. I was just stunned that he was aware of rally length at 4-2 in the first set and that he was already getting a little panicky. Um, usually players don't think about rally length. Um, so, and actually he, he tried to change gears too quickly and say, I'm not going to win with first strike tennis. Whoever told me zero to four, I got to throw that out. Um, I, I got to like, I got to outlast him somehow. That's how I'm going to win this match. And then that ended up being to his detriment. Well, he was being hit because he was being hit because Novak was playing fairly aggressively and pinning him. But what about the set? What about the second set? I thought Alcaraz was pretty aggressive on the forehand. It was just an amazing set of tennis, you know. So yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say someone was doing something wrong. Someone was dominating uh, with something right or or anything like that. I mean, it was just a really awesome tug of war. I think the biggest difference between the first set and the second set 
uh, was was Alcaraz's nerves, you know, that that settled down. I think it took an hour, 15 minutes for him to just calm down. Um, and I think that was the biggest difference in him winning the set, but he was still uh, much more unclutched than Djokovic. Like if you recall the four break points, even in the first set, I mean, two of them were really bad miss- misses. Uh, but there were there were moments where it's like, oh, here's an opportunity for Carlitos, and it was error, you know, over anxious error. I was really impressed with Novak. Uh, yes, the mixing up the serves. I think there were two tactics that I saw. One was going behind Alcaraz often. The clay was slippery, and I think it was tough for Alcaraz to turn back the other way where he came from, and it takes away your speed. In a full sprint, who's faster than Alcaraz? But if you just keep hitting behind, you're not really letting him get to that sprint. And then the other thing was go hard at the forehand. Rush the forehand, make him run to the forehand. Joel, what did you make of those? Either one, you can take either test. So just masterful. I think hitting behind him is really good because now you're taking out the, the hitting on the run and also the depth. And we've talked often, um, Craig O'Shaney talks about this, about how forehands can break down. I mean, it's a very interesting thing that happens in tennis. And Novak, I think what I was most impressed with was how assertive the application of pressure. This gets to the thing I brought up the last show about what do we, with Novak, are we talking defense? Are we talking offense? And I think there's a transcendent language that I want to find for this. And look how he, you know, it wasn't like aggressive in the shot making come to net hit winners, but just kind of court position and alertness and, and aware of his opponent's vulnerability. And uh, to get back to the stuff about the Alcaraz tactics in a long match, you discard it for a time, but then things change and you might have to bring it back. Another tactic, you know, it's not like it, in two out of three sets, you can maybe discard one tactic and then go to the other one. But over a long match, lots of things changed. I mean, what's what's so unfortunate about this match is we didn't get to then see it play out in the third and fourth sets. It kind of the match ended up just kind of halted, even though they finished it. Yeah, I, in our preview show, I said that if if I were Novak, based on the last few sets where Alcaraz had struggled or that match in Rome where he lost, there could be errors to be found on the forehand. So um, he probably was well aware of that, you know, charted everything Alcaraz has done the last six months. Um, but you know the the you make a great point about going behind and and i remember the point where alcaraz slipped and may have even skinned up his palms a little bit having to reverse thinking he might need to retrieve and then he just couldn't get there um i couldn't believe how fast for 36 no novak's um reflexes were he was holding the ball to the last second, especially when he was in the forecourt. I mean, it's a proven scientific fact that your reflexes are start are supposed to start to get slower as you age. And I thought his reflexes were every bit as fast, maybe even faster than Alcaraz's. Well, I think maybe it's also from, you get back to that attention for details. So whether they, they weren't quite having a, a reflex contest, but they were having a, a court awareness contest and Novak just had obviously studied some of these patterns. And when you're doing things, when you want to hit behind someone, you need to have at least established or make them be aware of the fact that you can hit into the open court because then you get the space. Otherwise they're just going to stay there anyway. And I think Novak, again, I just, I just found him hitting the ball, arriving to the ball earlier and then yeah, holding a swing and then being able to pick his spot more. Are you guys talking like mainly about the close quarters, like cat and mouse exchanges? Yeah. Talking about reflexes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I am. No, sure. Sure. I just wanted to clarify, just clarifying for the, for the listeners. Oh, I'm also thinking about even the patterns in some of the points, because there's a way Alcaraz, Alcaraz can make some of these opponents in baseline exchanges feel like they're in a cat and mouse because he's just pounding them, you know, running them around the court so heavily. And I thought Novak was just, he seemed to have a sixth sense where a lot of Alcaraz's shots were both in those up close ones, but even in the baseline rallies. Or I the told- ones where Novak was at the net and Alcaraz was at the baseline too. Sure. I totally agree with that. A lot of great anticipation by Novak. And in some cases, getting Alcaraz to miss because you see out of the corner of your eye when your opponent is is reading you uh, correctly. 
and it makes you go for more because they're in the right spot. I, I think so. I think it's underrated how many misses are because of that. And then in some of the cat and mouse also, I just, it goes back to Alcaraz just being a little bit panicky. I thought the targets sometimes were really small and he was missing balls just wide that it, 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 it was a target miss because he'd hit the ball clean and it would go just wide because you're trying to cut everything too perfect. And Novak just has that calmness. He knows exactly how much risk he needs to, uh, he needs to take on. And then the last thing I want to make sure we get in on the forehand topic, you can't just go to Alcaraz's forehand. You're going right. to die. You're going to die that way. You have to go there. Well, you have to go there mm -hmm. with good backhands down the line with great forehands cross court. So I just think whenever you discuss a tactic as, as kind of simplified as, well, you know, just go to the forehand and get errors there. It's, you also just need to have the, the skills to pay the bills. Exactly. The skills to pay the bills. That's great. Well, look, yeah, if you're going to go after someone's a strong shot, Alcaraz is strong, about it, you, you better have something behind it. And I, and I thought, no, if we talked about this being a potential command performance from him and it didn't fully play out that way, but I for sure thought it did in the first set. I mean, that was a very impressive first set Novak played. It was yeah. and an and impressive performance, uh, really overall, uh, from, from Djokovic, no doubt. Um, you know, yes, it, it would have been nice if, if loss of fitness wasn't really how the last two sets played out. Uh, but let's move on to, to the final. I have I have a question oh, okay. since we're transitioning. Um, were you guys really jarred by the difference in I I'm I don't can't really put words in what, to what I'm trying to say. Difference in style, difference in tempo, difference in um. I, what is it level um between the two matches? Oh, Wait, interesting. Between Madrid, that's a great question. Madrid and this one. No, no, between the two semifinals. Oh, um, no, I wasn't surprised. I was, I, 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 I kind of not knew. surprised, jarred by it. Like, wow, this is really different. Oh, no, but I expected them to be different. I thought one, you know, we knew the first one was going to be this kind of like, you know, highly anticipated champions, the all, the all the stuff we talked about. And the other was kind of like tennis guys, proficient players. I don't think I, I didn't, I wasn't, I don't know. Gil, what are you, what are you thinking? I was like, is this court playing way slower suddenly? That, yeah. that was kind of what I was feeling. And I'm like, is it the temperature? Did they water the court more? Like what's going on here? Because it's everything... like a different game. That's why I couldn't put it into words. What you just said was it slow? It was like slower, or someone had watered the court. Well, and yeah. it also was it also was evening. I'll tell you one thing. To go back um, ten years, I was at the tremendous Djokovic Nadal 2013 semi. Rafa nine seven in the fifth, I believe. Uh, deep fifth, very late, and and all this energy and all this stuff. It's almost. It's almost like the clay itself takes this energy hit too. You have been run on for four hours and all the, and the people. And then out came uh, Sangha and Ferrer to play their semi. And the energy was so flat and Sangha got hurt most by it. Dave Ferrer, as you would appreciate, Gil, was on it. And he won that semi handily and got to the finals. But um, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't charred by it. I thought that's what I thought it was going to be, that second semi. But it was definitely, I, definitely no, different. I, I, I couldn't put my, I never thought about it. I didn't put too much thought into it until now, but I, yeah, it's, it's the pace, the pace of everything is just, it's everything is slowed down. And Hey, like if we watch challenger tennis, it'll be even slower. And if we go to the futures, it'll be even slower. And if we go to the juniors, it'll be slower. Like the pace of play is a good indication of just how, how high level. Well, also that. Court. Yeah. And also the variety, I think, you yeah. know, and, and that, that goes to pace because if you are having players who play more in the forecourt, either because they play a pattern and they approach the net or because one of them drop shots and, and they end up in a two up kind of battle, um, then time is taken away. 
right? You don't have Casper Root's loopy ball that takes a long time to get to the other side. Um, so it, it the points are actually themselves, although it's nanoseconds, they're actually faster points. You're also looking at a uh, at a court that's a match that's starting at 3 p.m. and another match that's starting 6:30 or 7 p.m. And so it's a, it's a it's cooler, somewhat. And uh, yeah, and the styles, definitely the styles, but also the whole the whole energy. I mean, yeah, Novak's Novak, who's won 22 slams. Alcaraz is number one in the world and won one. And we know, and every, we've talked about his, everyone's talked about his game and the dynamic qualities. And then we had um, Zverev and and Rude, and they're great. I mean, Rude is four in the world. Zverev has been top tenor. So it's just, yeah, it's a, they're more of the contemporary playing style. Right. I mean, I, I think Novak was trying to make that match against Alcaraz as fast as possible because he's the best at keeping his strokes compact and never being rushed. And I mean, Alcaraz, some of the forehand of forehand exchanges were like just mind blowingly fast. And normally yeah. Novak was winning them. Well, and I think Novak's strategy a lot of it was okay, this guy likes to do things to me. I'm going to take the racket out of his hands. And maybe he's a little nervous. I'm just going to be all over him in my way, in the Nova, in the way Novak can. And again, I thought it was uh, just, just brilliant, just a brilliant effort from Novak. I mean, for example, as the third set began, even though Alcaraz had won the second, there wasn't this feeling like Alcaraz is coming and he's going to break it open before he got hurt. Did did you guys feel that? Uh, in the third, the second, no, I was no. like 50, 50 on the, exactly. on the match. Yeah. Now let's see it start. Oh, it, it wasn't like he had just kind of like gained the momentum and this major way. It's like, okay, now we're even let's, let's see this third. I was wondering about Alcaraz's energy. Honestly, I was wondering about both of their energy. Actually. I thought that second set was so intense that there's going to be an effect. And I didn't know which way the effect was going to go. Like you recall the, the 2021 match that Nadal and Djokovic played, the fourth set was flat because the third set just took it out of, of Rafa. Um, so the fourth set was flat. And I, I had a feeling this that might happen again here. All right, Kasparud beats Verev in that much slower semifinal. Is, uh, how, how, before we get to the matchup and putting him in the framing of like, him against Novak. Let's just take a second to assess where Root is at. He had a tough start to the year. He turned it around with the Rome semifinal. And now for a second straight year, he's in the Roland Garros final. It is his third major final. He's been in many, he's been in other big titles, uh, but big finals rather. He's been to the final of Miami. He's been to the final of the year end championships, but he still doesn't have a title above the 250 level hasn't won any of these big finals. Where's Casper Ruud at? I mean, is he ready for prime time? Is, how do you, how do you like measure his, and he's still young. He's not a finished product at all. Where do you measure him right now? I love the tweet from this past week that I read. It was maybe like three or four days ago. And it said, all y'all are going to be laughing when Casper takes home the trophy. <laughs> Um, because everyone, you know, says, makes fun of him, says he's dry, he's boring. Curios says that about him. He's consistent. And I kept picking him in these clay run-ups to Roland Garros, and he wasn't himself. And then it came time to preview Roland Garros, and I was like, Casper still hasn't really you know, become the guy he was at this time last year. What is it? So I started researching to see if he had an injury. Nope, didn't have any injuries. I saw him interviewed by Prakash on the tennis channel desk at one point. And he basically just said in so many words that he'd had sort of a mini crisis of confidence. Mm -hmm. But he certainly played himself back into good standing inside his own head in this tournament. And it was just a beat down today. I mean, a, of a very resurgent, good, experienced player in Zverev. It was a very good match. I think great from the way Rude played. I mean, like I, I wrote about it. I mean, 
one guy with a great backhand, the other with great forehand. I'll take a great forehand all the time over a great backhand. And he really commanded the court. I mean, he was airtight in every category. He just, I mean, there's a mini, little mini hiccup in the second set where he was uh, serving a one, two, love 40 and got out of that and was in control of the, of the court. And, you know, he's now been, he's now in his third slam final. We could name a whole bunch of players who've not done that, who are spoken about. And here he is performing and got through some tough matches here. The, the, um, Quarterfinal versus Holger Rune was kind of had a lot of in, intrigue around it prior, and he pretty much took care of that. And he's a solid, a solid campaigner, and I mean that as a complete compliment. I mean, this is a, a really good player, and and again, and he's young too. I mean, he's twenty four. He's going to be a different player by the time he's twenty eight. Yeah, I I really like his assets. I I don't, you know, I I can poke holes in his resume. I mean, he did not have a top ten win at a major until he beat Holger Runa. And then you can look at, at Holger and it's like, what was that performance? I mean, it was not really uh, indicative or representative of how good Runa actually is or, or should be. Uh, but all in all, I think this is his best run. I mean, the Zverev win, Zverev and Runa, I mean, I have them both as top 10, even though Zverev isn't a top 10 or in the rankings. Uh, he's top 10 in my power rankings, if that counts for something. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, his forehand is is elite. The first serve super underrated. Second serve is great. He moves well. Now, let's talk about the matchups, the the weaknesses. Wait, wait, and how I, I want to get back to the mat before the matchup. I want to get back to something that that you touched on with uh, okay. Runa. You know, it's funny that we saw we learned some things about Runa and Alcaraz in the course of this Roland Garros. And they're great, and they're going to continue to be great. But I, some, I sometimes think, and I know I fall prey to this too, I call it the venture capital approach to players. Like, they're young, they're new, they're hot, they're going this way. And then there are these folks like Rude and even Zverev. They've been around a little longer. You know, it's, it's a little more exciting to get excited about a freshman who could eventually be a Rhodes Scholar than a sophomore who pretty good too. And but you kind of overlook them because they're it doesn't seem like they're they're going hockey stick growth at this point, maybe. At this point, maybe. So, but we saw with our young hopefuls that they still have some uh, some polishing ahead of them. So I just want to point that out. And then yeah, let by all means let's talk about the matchup. Yeah, well said on that. I have nothing to add. Let's go um head to head wise. 4 0 for Novak. He hasn't lost a set. They've played twice at the ATP Finals. They've played another two times in Rome. Uh, I really think Djokovic has some very interesting ways of taking advantage of of Kasper Ruud's backhand. Uh, it's not going there over and over and over again because I think Casper actually wants you to do that. It's like, I'll just sit here and hit backhands and then eventually you'll slip up and I'll step around and I'll hit my massive forehand. What I think Novak does is open up the space, go hard into the forehand, and then get it to the backhand. Make him hit the backhand on the run, and when he hits the backhand on the run, that's where it can get vulnerable. He slices a lot on defense. I think Djokovic attacks that, and Novak likes to come forward against his backhand. I don't think Djokovic feels like he can come up with great passing shots on the backhand. A lot of serve and volley I'm expecting here. A lot, as in 30? I think Novak will serve and volley more in this final than he has in any of his major finals throughout his career. I like that. Interesting. So you think he sees a great... So he sees a lot of open territory in this matchup based on experience and and the assessment of Rude's game. I like that assessment. I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. Wow. Okay. He sees a guy who's on the back fence, 20 feet behind the baseline, who likes to hit a very high return. I mean, it's prime. Mm -hmm. It's serve and volley, serve and volley country. I think Rude's backhand has probably more top spin than anyone else on tour backhand. Two handers. I think I think you're right with two handers. Yeah. Um, so that is maybe a little bit different look than what he's seen in this tournament so far. 
I think Rude as as a good mover, um, he uses his margin over the net on both wings on returns and all that, even on his his kick serve to adjust his position in the court. Um, the one area where I think Novak will really have him is that because he's a forehand dominant player, he tends to adjust his recovery position ever so slightly to look for a forehand. And with a player like Novak, who has just a tremendous backhand down the line, I think um, he might have him on that. Uh, that'll be something that Casper needs to watch out for. Yeah, I know the patterns. I think I think the thing is there are a lot of things that we see Novak can do. A, he's beaten them every time they played. B, he's favored. C, he's been in these situations. All this stuff. And so for Rude, who a year ago was his first slam, I think he has a a better chance in this one than he did in his first one. But that doesn't mean I think he's like, yeah, it's kind. Of, but I feel a little, you know, it's a little tri tricky. You reach your first slam final and you lose it. Okay, your second, you know. The possibility of losing your first three straight slam finals is a little um can be a little frustrating. And he's obviously a heavy, heavy underdog. So the question is, what does he do to to innovate? You know, you lost to a guy, find another way to lose. Totally. I think that starts with take some risk on the backhand. And that's not what it is. Like as a shot, it is not risky. It's super safe. But I, I just think we've seen how that goes. Like Take it down the line. Ask more of it. Uh, and I, I think that's going to be important for him. I agree with that because in a way you got to think to yourself, look, I can do my things. It reminds me of, again, if someone like a, a David Ferrer or a Nisha Corey or a Rublev is in this kind of final. I think, yeah, you got your things. You're going to hang in a lot of rallies. You're going to be a lot of points. It's, it's like the re recreational, like, oh, every game went to deuce. You know, one of these kind of like sayings and you can lose. You know, three, three, and three. Okay, or, or you can say, okay, let me try something a little different, like a finding another way. You're right. Like maybe ask a little more of that backhand. Try a few down the line. Try a few ways to get to net. Some things that just shake it up a little. That no, no, this is not. This is not the same Casper Ruud you've already beaten four times. A bit, at least a bit. There's a ton of history stuff that we didn't get into. We'll do it after the match. Um, <laughs> we'll talk to you then. That'll do it for this episode of three. Remember, we're available on all podcast platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, and subscribe. And we will see you next time on the next episode of three. <laughs>